Hey, this is Daniel Grove with another video tutorial for Blender. I'm going to be breaking down a recent project I call the USS Quarantine, jokingly, because I started this huge spaceship project right around when the shutdown happened here in Texas. So I didn't have any photo shoots to do, didn't have a lot to do, so I said, hey, I'm going to start something big. I'm going to work really hard on it and see what I can come up with. And I had made a large scale spaceship before, and I really loved how it came out, and I had learned a lot since then. So I figured, hey, let's let's try it again. Let's see what else I can make. And I am very proud of what I made. It's one of my favorite things I've created in Blender. It got a lot of attention being on the thumbnail for a recent video I did, and I had a lot of people asking, you know, can you show us that spaceship? Like, can I download it? Can I... Can you teach us how you made that? And I thought to myself, well, I can't show you everything because it took forever. Uh, I mean, this would be like a whole like series, just so much video just to make this thing again. But I figured I could make at least an educational breakdown video showing you the individual pieces I made, how I put it together, and also some interesting stuff that I learned while making it. So unfortunately, that my computer can barely handle rendering this. Like it just takes all night to get like two or three seconds. So I really wish I could have a high definition render of this thing. I've only got like a few clips made, <laughs> sadly. Uh, but yeah, before we get to looking at the individual pieces, let me give you a few numbers here. The file itself is 124 megabytes. There are over 3 million triangles in the project and more than 50 materials. When I sat down to make this thing, I had to figure out what I wanted to make and why. I had to kind of run through my sci-fi, you know, database of knowledge and kind of wonder, like, what kind of ship is this going to be? Because I feel like if you're going to make something big like this, whether it's a spaceship or a village or a weapon or a vehicle, you have to kind of decide on things. You have to decide what role is this thing going to play in the world that it lives in? So I had to decide that this spaceship was going to be an interplanetary ship uh, that could travel close to the speed of light. And that's why I have this large disc on the front. That was the first thing that I started with was I wanted it to have some kind of protective shield or a shield projector on the very front that could protect it from subatomic particles and physical debris and other, you know, extra dimensional stuff while it's flying super duper fast through space, because that's definitely a problem. You will obliterate yourself if you hit so much as a small piece of rock. So I said, okay, I got to have something on the front to make this somewhat realistic to protect the rest of the ship. Next, I wanted people to live on it with simulated gravity. So I gave it these spinning rings. And I also wanted it to be for scientific research. So I gave a whole module dedicated to sensor arrays, scientific instruments, you know, dishes and all kinds of cameras and stuff like that. I also gave it some ports so that astronauts could come outside and fix things or work on stuff. And also so that other ships and pods and capsules could dock with it and connect, you know, um, through the docks, just like the International Space Station. I also gave a cabin for a scientist to live in or work in, as well as a number of uh, tank storage devices for fuel or collected energy. So I definitely put a lot of thought behind what I was making, and it really helped me kind of guide my creation process so that I wasn't just making stuff random and, you know, throwing random ideas together because that doesn't always turn out very well. So let me show you how I first started this project. Before I had anything made, I basically just sketched my basic shape ideas that I had in my head, um, and that guided you know what I would make in detail later. So uh, let me switch this to object mode, stop my animation, get my grid back. I feel like I don't know where I am without my floor. There we go. <laughs> oh, and uh, my X, Y, and Z, or my X and Y. You can turn these on and off by going to uh, viewport overlays. If you turn it off, everything goes away, even like object selection and everything. Makes it a lot cleaner. But if you want, you know, the overlays and add-ons, you can do that. I'm actually going to open a brand new Blender file. I think that that'll just be easier. Okay, so with an empty scene, what I made first was probably the front dish, which I started with a cylinder. R, Y to flip it 90 degrees, press it 90 and enter. In edit mode, I scaled it on the Y to make it thinner, and I grabbed one of these back faces because I knew I wanted to be a cone or conical shape, so I sized it up real big. There we go. If you, I like to have my move tool here so I can more easily grab stuff. Uh, extrude it and shrink it down some more to give it a little bit of a you know rounded shape. Give it some thickness by extruding that face. I for inset, and then I made kind of a smaller cone shape here. So that was the front shield, right? Let's give our move tool again. Let's move it up front. Next, I wanted to have another pod behind it. So make another cylinder, RY90. Moved it right up here and size it up a little bit. And um, I ended up putting a lot of solar panels and some tanks on there, which I hadn't really settled on yet until I had made more of my shape. Next, I wanted to have another smaller cylinder with rings around it. So I can just shift D and then press X to move it on the X axis. I'm going to put this back to global so it'll be a little easier. 
shrink it down. Now to make some rings, there's a few ways you can do it. Uh, one way to do it is to make another cylinder, size it up really big to the size of our rings, and then scale it on the X to be thinner. Now to get a, a hole in the middle, go to edit mode, grab this face, this face, inset it to however thick you want the ring to be, and then spacebar for your search function and type in bridge. And you're gonna do bridge edge loops, there we go. It just connects those two faces and makes a ring. And if you wanna get fancy and make these, you know, little uh, support beams, you can use extrude individual and make them go right into the center, there we go. So there, I'm gonna make another one, Shift D, Y, or X, sorry, right there. Make our axis a little bit longer so it all fits. X is the axis that the ship is going. I keep, I keep mixing it up. Okay, and then I'm going to have another uh, thicker cylinder here. Maybe uh, another thinner cylinder here with some, th some other stuff on it. And I was really just playing around with it. Honestly, when I really did this, you know, I had a few different variations of it. I, I made one and then I was like, nah, it looks too big in the middle, too small in the front. So I kind of, you know, I play with my scaling to see how big I wanted the shield to be, which kind of gives the illusion of, you know, scale for the rest of it. Um, so once I decided on you know, the, the general shape of my ship, uh, then I got, of course, moving into more detailed stuff. Um, I wanted to have some really powerful rockets on the back end. So one quick way to do that is uh, just add a cube, scale it down and then make it long and move it up. Now with our 3D cursor in the middle, which it is, if it isn't, you can do Shift C to reset it. Set your origin point to 3D cursor, Shift D R X 90, enter and then repeat, repeat with shift R. There we go. So I had kind of that thing going on. Oh, and still on my 3D cursor and put it back to individual. There we go. Much easier to work with. So, you know, I, I, I it wasn't this good when I first tried it. <laughs> I had a few different variations and once I settled on it, then I started working on the actual uh, shape. So what I did was I grabbed all of this and I actually moved it into a, uh, its own collection, which it already is right now. And I'm just gonna name it sketch. And I grabbed it all and I moved it way up high. I just moved it like vertically up on the Z to get it out of my way. And then I started building, you know, I basically recreated these shapes, but with much higher polygon. You can see these are very low poly. And I wanted this like project to be super high poly. I wanted, I didn't want it to have any edges. So when I made my cylinders, I think I made them around 300 or 200 uh, vertices. You can do that by doing shift A, make your cylinder. And down here, this little menu that may be hidden, you can turn your vertices up to you know whatever you want. Um, I wanted a lot of smoothness and, and actually more shapes to work with when I started doing extrusions and, and you know modeling. If I go into edit mode, you can see there's a lot of shapes to work with, a lot of vertices to edit. Okay, now another tip for a large project like this is to use collections, sub-collections, and name your objects. At least name your main objects, like each big chunk. You can see these are actually pretty large meshes. If I click on the right piece, well, they're, they're covered in small pieces. <laughs> there we go, so that's a big chunk right there. You know, the, the whole disk is one big mesh. If you go into edit mode, you can see it all. And there's of course a bunch of little things added all around that are different meshes. But I definitely encourage you to be diligent about naming your objects and naming your collections. Um, I like to have a collections. I didn't, I'm a hypocrite right now because I didn't actually do this with this project. I've learned a lot even since this one. But what I'm trying to do more with larger projects is use collections for cameras and lights or just a collection for lights. Use a collection for the main large meshes like these big chunks. And then use another collection for the smaller detail pieces. That way you can turn them on and off for quick renders if you need to you know, examine something, make sure that the textures look right before you move on adding details on top of it. Um, and that really helps a lot with your organization and just the workflow of making stuff. Name things and use collections. And you can, like I said, you can use sub collections, which is a collection inside of another collection. I've got two right here. And these are actually for animated cameras that are moving and some that are still that I tried to use for an animated sequence <laughs> until I found out how long it took to render. All right, next part of the video, let's talk about the materials. So really good materials are the key to a really good model. And I'm not at all saying that mine is the best. You know, I'm sure a lot of you watching this video can do way better than me, and I'll totally admit that. Um, but I have learned that good materials is the a definitely huge starting point to having a great looking model and a good render. And what I mean by good materials is a PBR shader, which is a multi-image shader. You can see some right here. They've got bump, they've got shininess, they've got, you know, specular. These little yellow dots are actually a, a single little spot on the texture that is for the emission, so it glows like a little light. I spent a lot of time UV unwrapping this stuff. 
and adding these textures. One of my favorite textures is this panel right here, these little square kind of access panels. I just love them. They look very strong. They looked very clean and, and futuristic. Um, and they wrap around really great on all kinds of shapes. Where I got most of these textures from is CC0 Textures. Uh, this website has got a ton of really great free uh, PBR based shaders uh, with you know multi-image maps, really good resolution. Um, that is a lot of fun to play with and can make your stuff look really nice. The solar panels, which are also are one of my favorite parts of this model because they just shine so pretty. Uh, this is actually a pretty complex shader tree that I found online for free. Look at that, that is the solar panel. <laughs> and inside of here is another shader tree, which is even crazier. The solar panel shader is made by Keener Saw. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, you can find it by going to the Blender Procedural Textures Facebook group. Just search for that name, Keener Saw or Solar Panel or Solar Cell, I think he called it, and you can find it, download it for free and play with it. It's really nice and easy to use. Let's get rid of the shader tab and I can show you one of the textures that I rebuilt in Photoshop and it is the main whole texture. These lines, these kind of panels here. Um, I had a file that I got um, from a website. I forgot where. I believe the ir original image was called Soft Panels and I really liked it, but it was a little bit low resolution for what I needed and it had some, gr some grime and dirt added that you know, if not textured right, it will obviously be tiled. And I knew I was gonna be tiling this all over the place because I wanted a really good starting like base metal material. It's basically on every other part of the ship. It's kind of the main metal, main surface. Even right here, I have a darker version of it with more variation, uh, but it's the, it's the same base image. So I had the image, it, was, it wasn't exactly what I needed. So I brought it into Photoshop, enlarged the image to I think 4,096 pixels square, and I basically redrew it <laughs> using the pen tool and shapes and layers and a little bit of variation in colors. And I made like two or three different variations of that. So I basically upscaled it by recreating it from scratch. And I was able to get a really high resolution with no dirt um, unless I wanted it. So, you know, I just had total control. So that was fun, took some time, but I'm really glad I did it because I was able to keep this really nice um, texture and get what I wanted out of it. Okay, you may have noticed there are some missing texture files. See this pink color up here? That means there is an image map missing. Now, after I made this file, I uh, backed up everything um, during the quarantine period and I ended up re kind of reorganizing some of my textures. So there's still some textures that are missing and I'm gonna show you how to find them. There is an easy batch way to do this. If you have a number of images missing, you can go to File, External Data, and find missing files. Now you need to navigate to the topmost folder where you know all these images are inside of. So if I have all my textures inside of, you know, say a textures folder, or in my case, these came from my PBR folder, which, which is in my shaders folder and then my PBR folder. So they're all in here somewhere. I don't know exactly where. So anyway, once you find your topmost folder, click find missing files and it will search through all these folders. It will take some time. If you have a bunch of missing images, it may crash your blender. I did one where I was trying to fix and find about, I don't know, 20 to 30 different images and it just crashed multiple times and I had to do it manually. So let me show you how to do it manually. So, you know, there are other ways to do it. I'm going to open up my shaders tab and I'm going to find the object that has pink on it. Now, if I go to my materials tab here, there's a bunch of different materials. Luckily, this one is obviously the one with the missing texture. I'm going to click on my metal three, which is where the missing images are. Zoom in a little bit. I've got three image maps here. One I bet is for the color. One is for the roughness, which is basically the reflection parts. And the other one is a normal map. So even though they all say metallic on top, just ignore that. It's because I copied and pasted. So here's what we're gonna do to find this missing image. I'm gonna click on the image node, press in to get our little info panel over here, go to properties, and here it is. This shows us where the image used to be. So let me make it pretty big. It used to be in documents, blender files, shaders, PBR, sci-fi, metal plate 02, metal plate 022. <laughs> pretty long. All I care about is this last bit, the actual file name. So I'm going to select that and copy it or control C, command C on Mac. And with that copied, I know that I moved everything off of my C. That's what I did. I moved it from C to my D drive and it's not in documents anymore. So I'm going to go back to my image that's missing, click on the open folder icon, and now I need to find it. It's not in C anymore. I know that. So I need to find where I moved it to, which is blender assets, shaders, PBR, and if I move this down here, the actual PBR file itself is in the sci-fi sci-fi folder. So sci-fi, and then over here, it's called Metal Plate 022 SD. So I can find Metal Plate 019, here it is, 022 SD. Hit enter, 
and here they all are. So the one that I am looking for is base color. If I can, I can actually paste it because I remember I copied it earlier. Yeah, it's, it's the base color, which is right here. So open image. And there we go. Now, not all of them are in there. There's still some missing images. These ones down here are still missing. But let's try a little trick and see if I can save myself some time. So I'm going to copy the uh, folder, basically the folder location just before the file name. I'm going to do control C. Click on this missing image because this, this is a roughness map. It's missing as well. See, it's still looking elsewhere. And I'm going to paste it right before control V. Make sure there's only one slash and enter. Okay, yep, it popped up. I, I just saw, it's very subtle, but I saw a change in the texture. And one more image is missing, which is the normal map. So click on this, click just before the file name, paste, and make sure there's only one slash, enter. There we go, now we have a normal map. This object also has some missing image textures, and look at this, it's not showing us which image has the pink on it. So we have to go into edit mode, deselect everything, and go through each one. Select, nope, select, Nope. Select no metal two. Ah, there it is. Let's zoom in and make sure. Yep, metal two selected the pink parts. Let's make sure it's not this one. Select, nope, it's not that. So metal two has missing image maps, which is in our shader tab up here. I've got kind of a messy layout going on. So we've got three images here, and I bet if I paste, if it's in the same sci-fi folder, yeah, let's try and paste here. All right, control V to paste. And I need to back up and get rid of this metal plate folder name. Enter. Look at that, it changed. It's not pink anymore. That means it found the image in the new location. And here we've got the same thing. So select, paste, and back, get rid of that. Previous PBR shader folder name. Enter, is it only one slash? Yep, there. Almost done, and we got our normals map. Select before the file name, paste, and erase the old PBR folder name. And there we go, we found the missing image maps and there's less pink, it's not done yet, but you get the picture. All right, on the front of my ship, I have some animated textures I wanna show you real quick because it was really fun making those. Let me uh, get rid of all this junk, there we go. I'm gonna play my animation. Now if I zoom in, you can see these lines are moving out and these cool little procedural um, Chebby Chev or whatever squares are animating and they're moving. So to do this, you need to select your material, which I believe is called Shield Lights. Get back to your shader tab. Oops. So the mapping node is basically telling, you know, this wave texture where to place things, the scaling, the rotation, the position, right? That's what it does with the vector information from the UV unwrapping right there. So first I unwrapped it, then I used the mapping node to position it, and then I animated this parameter right here to make it move. So if you look at the X parameter right here on the mapping node, it's purplish pink, and it's moving every now and then. If I put my mouse over it, it refreshes, but it is moving on its own, and I did that with a driver. So I'm going to right click and delete drivers. Okay, now it's back to normal. Nothing, this this little shield is not moving anywhere. Let's go to these, they're bigger and funner to look at. A little bit, uh, a little bit blinding too. So to animate this X parameter, see how I, if I move that, they slide. Um, we want the numbers to be going down, it looks like. That makes them move outwards. So right click on the parameter you want to animate. Do insert single keyframe. Now we're gonna split this some more and get our graph editor. This allows us to see and uh, manipulate keyframes. And here's our keyframe we made right over here, this little dot. So if I press period, it zooms in to this keyframe right in the middle, and that is the one keyframe we made. You doesn't matter, it doesn't matter where in your timeline it's made. It does not matter, it doesn't have to be at the beginning. So once your uh, single keyframe is created and it's selected, press in go to modifiers and add generator. Now this will basically um, increase your, you know, keyframe initial number really fast. It, well, it, you can control the speed with some math here. Okay, if we press play, it's moving really slow. Now we, if we can change this number to 0.5, slows it down even more, we can do negative 0.5 to reverse the direction. And now if we go each frame, it's increasing Look, I'm using my arrow on my keyboard. Look up here in my shaders tab where my um, mapping node is. Each arrow is a frame. It goes up by 0.5 each frame, or actually down. Usually you have to have this at a really small number. So uh, looks like 0.01 gives you a, a decent outward direction. Moving this 
uh, wave texture or really any texture. You could have an image, you could have any procedural noise. Mine is going through a color ramp, which is being mixed with um, something else <laughs> and spit out to an emissions and there, and that's only on this circle. Okay, uh, over here, we've got another animated texture, which I use the same trick. Let's click on Shield Detail Light, which is this material, and here it is. Look, I have two things animated. I have the Z, which is moving it outwards, and I have the W. So if you put your noise on 4D, you have another dimension of animation you can play with. You can actually move it in a way that it's kind of like moving through a fourth dimension of time. It's evolving and changing. Now, if this thing wasn't moving left or right, it would just be changing like a little computer screen, kind of doing random squares and shapes, which I really like how it looks. So I wanted to, to evolve and animate, but I also wanted it to move outwards as if this is projecting an energy shield to protect the whole ship from everything crazy out in space. And that's how I animated those textures. All right, in this next part, I'm going to do some basic modeling and show you how I constructed some of these pieces. First, we'll do this ring, and then maybe we'll do one of these ports. And uh, yeah, we'll get a little bit of a hard surface uh, tutorial going on in this video as well. So let me open up my other blank blender file here. I'm gonna delete this random cylinder. We've got our sketch up here somewhere. There it is. So we're gonna be working down here in the center. So to make a space ring for a spaceship or space station, I'm going to do shift A, make a circle. And we need a lot of a lot of vertices here because this is going to be big and we're going to cut it into four pieces. We're gonna go with a quarter design so that we only have to model one quarter and the other three quarters will be, you know, basically instantly, you know, the same. They'll be cloned almost. So we're gonna make this something that can be divided by four. I'm just gonna go with 400, size it up. Now I'm going to go into edit mode and press F inset. And this is the thickness of your ring. So if you want it to be a huge ring with people inside, this, you know, like a mega structure. If you want it to be, you know, maybe like a few, you know, houses wide, if you were to walk on the circle, make it this. It's really all up to your scaling of what you want. And again, you have to decide on that early on. So I'm going to make this face, uh, you know, there, I'm gonna press enter, delete it. Now we have a ring and we're going to uh, delete everything but one of these quarters. So press seven to be see the above view. And I've got my random spaceship sketch here. Let me uh, select that with the box select, with, which is B and H to hide it. Okay, so click on our ring tab for edit mode, go to face select and box select, which is B. And we're going to grab the quarter that we wanna keep and then we're gonna invert it. Make sure you have selected right up to the edge of that and right up to the edge of here. We've got a perfect quarter selected. We're going to do control I to invert the selection, delete face. Cool, so now we just have a quarter here and the origin point is right in the middle so we can rotate it perfectly, right? All right, escape to get out of that. So I'm going to press Alt D, R, Z, 90 and enter. And then Shift R, R. I just did a Alt D, which is a linked copy. So whatever I do to this, it's gonna do it to all the other four pieces or three other pieces. And that's what we want. So we only have to do a little bit of work and Blender will do the rest of it for us. Okay, so we've got our quarter over here, which is like the actual piece we've, we're have we gonna be editing. We could edit any of them really, um, but we're just gonna focus on this one. So edit, select all, extrude up. So once we've decided how thick to make it, we're also going to do another trick to save us even more time. And we're gonna use a mirror modifier. So go to your wrench, add mirror modifier. There it is. And we want it to mirror along the Z. There we go, Z, awesome. Now these other pieces don't have that. So let me see if I can link it. So let's select these and then click on our main one. Control L and link modifiers. Yes, there we go. Okay, so they all have the mirror modifier, cool. So the reason why I did that is now I only need to edit one piece and it copies it on the bottom and that copies it all to all the others. Pretty awesome, right? As you can tell, I'm really lazy. <laughs> I like to say efficient though. So I'm gonna do a bevel along this edge, select that edge and control select that edge, which grabs everything in between. Control B there. Now when I get out of tab, you see that it updated. At first I was a little freaked out. It wasn't editing, it wasn't updating, but now it is. Okay, so we got a bevel. Oh, we need to delete the uh, in-between face. So let's solo this by hitting forward slash. Let's delete this wall right here. And I'll show you why in a second. It'll allow us to do a really cool trick with the inset. Select that face and delete. Okay, forward slash again to get back to, uh, forward slash is solo mode, by the way. Toggles it, solo and not solo. Okay, so with these, uh, this wall selected, press I and then press B. Look at that. 
with B, it, it doesn't inset along the, the wall, which is great because the other pieces have, you know, they're going to meet uh, in the middle. So E to extrude it down. Get out of tab, get out of edit mode and it updates. You may want to delete this little miniature wall here to make it a seamless ridge, delete face. There we go, we've got a really cool uh, ring going on. Let me uh, put on a matte cap so it's a little easier to see. Yeah, that helps a little bit, some little more detail. Okay, let's make a ridge by doing Control R. We can slide this around wherever we want it and maybe make another one right here. Now I'm going to grab this and then Control click over here. And I'm going to extrude this, but I want to make sure it doesn't go out like that. I don't want that kind of extrusion. Go to your extrude tool and do extrude along normals, which will extrude it. Be very careful. It's very finicky. It goes really fast in the wrong direction. So go out. You can hold shift to make it more refined. Cool. Get out of edit mode. Now we've got a nice fat ridge there. We can add a bunch of little micro details by clicking on uh, a face. Right click over here or a control click, and then watch this. If we press inset, but we don't want one ring, although you could do that, I'm gonna press I again to get an individual inset. There we go. And now, extrude is still on extrude on normals, which is good because we want it to point outwards, right? Now we can do this, click on it very carefully. Oh, there we go, it's very fast. We can hold shift and do it inwards or outwards. I'm gonna do it inwards because that looks cool. Nice. Now, to do windows, that's where a little bit of work comes in. Uh, what I suggest doing is to go to the above view. I'd say grab a few faces like this. We're gonna make this into a window. Now, instead of doing the same edit over and over, we're gonna do another Daniel Grove lazy trick. I'm gonna do shit with these faces selected, Shift D, Enter. Now we have a separate little group of faces, and I'm going to just move it straight up. So GZ1. So it's, it's separate. We're going to put it back down and we're going to duplicate it. But in the meantime, first I want to make this a little window, window piece. So I'm going to scale it down a little bit, extrude it up. We can bevel these edges, select these edges. Oops, edge mode. Select, shift, select, shift, select, and shift, select. Control B, add some uh, more segments by hitting the plus button. There we go. Grab these faces here and do an inset. Make it go down, scale it. Oops, I have my um, proportional editing on for some reason, which is the letter O to turn that off. <clears throat> scale that in, inset again, and then extrude down again. There we go, looks like a little window, right? Now, uh, I moved it exactly up one blender unit earlier, so I'm gonna move it back down exactly one blender unit again. So uh, here's a cool trick to grab uh, a separate little piece of mesh. Select any face and press Control L. It grabs all the selected or linked uh, vertices. Now, GZ negative one, enter. There we go, it's right back where it needs to be. Now we're gonna rotate, we're gonna copy and rotate this a whole bunch of times, um, but we need to rotate it based on the 3D cursor, which should be in the middle, but it's not anymore. So shift C, there we go. Now our 3D cursor is in the middle. Let's go to above view by hitting number seven. Now we need to set our origin point to 3D cursor. And now if we do shift D R, look, I can put it wherever I want. But we need to be mathematical about this because we're dealing with you know, quarters here. We don't want it to be all weird and mismatched. So I'm gonna do um, Shift D R, let's try 20. Shift R, Shift R, Shift R. There we go. So if you like that arrangement, you can see these two are next to each other. If you want it to be more evenly spaced, maybe 15 I think might do it or 30. I'm not sure the exact number, but uh, I mean, this doesn't look bad, it looks, looks fine. So we've got some windows, and look on the bottom, ah, more windows. Isn't that great? Just do a little bit of work and get a whole lot of results. That's the way I like to edit. Okay, we can do another um, panel trick by grabbing a shoot, few pieces here. Shift D, and we're going to scale it uh, down. Oops, not on the 3D cursor. We don't want this. We want an individual. Scale it down a little bit, and then I'm going to extrude it out and scale that in. Okay, so we're basically just making this little bumpy square piece, okay? You may not want it to be so big, so we can maybe move this back down a little bit. There we go. Make it a little bit more subtle. Okay, now once you've made your chunk, Control L, go back to 3D cursor origin, and here we're gonna duplicate it again. You can see it, it's a little sliver right here. Shift D, R, Z, 30. There we go, and then Shift R, 
and there we go. I think those are all, hey look, evenly spaced. Pretty cool. Okay, now this tube is really thin. <laughs> if this is a window, it's like a full length window from floor to ceiling. So we may wanna move these in a little bit by selecting them and we're gonna do extrude along normals again. And it should go towards the center of the circle. Oh yeah, there it is, nice. So we can make more of a floor here, make it a little bit larger in scale. And we got a bevel. Remember, try to avoid sharp 90 degree angles. Ah, very, okay, there we go. Bevel it. I'm gonna make a little bit of a curve. Cool, oh, that looks nice. Inner curve on the inside. And then we can make some, you know, loop cuts here, control R. Uh, we can grab a, a range of these and E. Actually not E, we wanna use this control, which gives us the extrude along normals there. And then maybe another one here, make it a little bit going further in towards, oops, further in towards the center. Man, this tool is just really hyperactive. There we go, that's cool, some nice rings. And that's where we would add the you know support beams that connect it to the central spine or axis. Um, so there's some basic hard surface modeling for ring shaped objects. And we only made one piece and it did the rest for us. And yeah, I hope that was helpful for you guys. Next, I'm going to make a module with some railing. Cause if you look really close, let me switch back over. If you look really close at some of my modules, I actually have railing for the astronauts to, to connect to. <laughs> See this white railing? I imagine them clipping on something uh, while they you know, do their spacewalk so they don't go flying and drift into space and die. Um, there's railing on almost all major pieces, even over here over here or under there. I put railing everywhere. And the way I did that is a really simple trick that doesn't use a lot of uh, a lot of time. So let's switch back. I'm gonna add railing on the outside of this, why not? So to do that, Shift A, we're gonna make a circle. And let's add mm, maybe 200 pieces, 200 vertices, scale it up. And we wanna put the railing along this diagonal. So we're going to uh, scale it just right about there. Uh, and we're gonna use mirror modifier to save us some more time. So mirror, tab into edit mode, and let's um, hit F to fill. So we had this basically an empty circle mesh, right? Just this boring circle was just the edges. There was no face on it. So I hit F to fill it, go back into edit mode, move it up and scale it in a little bit. So it's, it's kind of right on that diagonal slope. Let me zoom in, you can see what I'm talking about. Yeah, right there. Okay, I'm happy with that. And the mirror modifier, make sure it's on Z. There we go, we have our duplicated piece down there and this is our original. Now to make this a railing, we're going to use a wireframe modifier, which we can add by going into our modifiers and wireframe. And when we apply it, it makes this kind of weird shape. Let me just solo the, the railing that we're working on. It turns our mesh into basically a wireframe in our modifiers tab, we can adjust the thickness of the wireframe. Um, we can also check boundary to make sure it's kind of a solid rim shape. And let's scale it down because we want this to be a pretty small metal railing. Now, if you go back to normal mode, you can tell this ring, you know, is not, uh, let, me, let me turn on random colors, there we go. This green ring, <laughs> it's just a random color, uh, is not connected. So we need to connect it to the central piece. So go to tab, and also turn on this option right here on cage so that when we edit the wireframe modifier, we can actually see it, what it's doing. We're going to extrude by pressing E enter and then just scale it in. There we go, look at that. It made a whole bunch of other little faces and let's move that face that we're extruding maybe up a little bit. So there we go. We've got a whole bunch of little spines sticking out that are holding the support beam on. And that's how I did um, all those miniature, you know, things. These are actually just a wireframe. I can go into edit mode. Look at this. This is the shape. It's just like a big old weird, you know, low poly <laughs> ring and with the wireframe modifier applied over here. It's literally just a circle with the inset and the uh, modifiers over here, which I've got wireframe and then bevel to add some roundedness to the, to the wireframe. It gives me that nice shape that I wanted. All right, let's make something fun and shiny. We're going to make one of these uh, cool space port exit doors, um, which is a lot of fun, you know, radial style hard surface modeling. So let's go over to our blank. Let's get all this and hide it. Just put it out of the way. We're going to center our 3D cursor by shift C, shift A, add a cylinder. Make sure it has a good amount of vertices. I'm going to start with 200. I'm just going to scale it up. 
and then scale it down and make it kind of flat, maybe, maybe around there. That's a good proportion. Okay, so let's start with some basic shapes. So edit mode, grab that top face and bevel it. You can make it rounded or you can make it diagonal. Now here's something you need to understand. Look how my bevel is kind of weird and flat. Let me go to a different view. That doesn't look right, right? It's, it's not really evenly distributed. That's because if I get out of edit mode, this object is actually being scaled. Look at my scales, my scaling numbers over here. They're all weird, they're not ones. So to fix that, do control A and apply the scale. Now they're all reset to one. If I go to edit mode and do a bevel, it's all correct. That's how it should be. Okay, so I'm gonna say I'm happy with that. Let's do some inset and extruding to make kind of a little opening here. Maybe bevel that a little bit. Inset, make a bump. Inset, make another bump. Inset, just lower it to make it like a cone shape. It's really just playing around with stuff. There's no science to it. Well, I mean, there is a science to it. <laughs> it's called <laughs> astroengineering <laughs> or NASA. Yeah, here we go. I'm gonna, this is going to be the actual opening port door right there, okay? Now, if I want to have a slit here like it's going to open, I can make a cube, raise it up, make it really skinny. And I'm going to use it as a, as a Boolean. So with this, the cube selected, shift select the port, and then control minus, and that does an automatic Boolean operation. Now we can play with this cube and make it, you know, the shape that we want. We can have it like this. I'm going to do extrude along uh, normals. And then we can like move these down a little bit, make like a diagonal kind of crease. Yeah, but make sure this is, this is inside that rim. There we go. That looks pretty cool. And if you want it to be centered, we can just kind of drag it up right there. Maybe scale it a little bit. If you don't want to see it anymore, just uh, click on it and press H to hide it. Now to get some more micro details up in here, let's add a rim. So I just alt clicked this inside face and it grabbed the whole interior rim. I'm going to press control R and plus enter. So I have basically a, a now a ring on the ring. And if I hold alt and click on the inside here, now I have that. So I can apply, you know, a metal material to everything, and then I can apply a glowing material just to that ring. So emission, make it blue, make it pretty strong, like 20. If I go to render view and click assign, see I had this face is selected, and I, with the blue light material, I clicked assign and boom. Cool. We can do other pieces if we want. Let's go back to material mode, make it a little bit more easy to see. That looks really pretty, doesn't it? We can do another glowing piece down here. So if we grab all these bottom faces by alt clicking and then assign, now there's a blue glowing down there. I, I always advise you have kind of a medium kind of metal color and use other variations. Use a light metal and then a darker metal to add more detail. Let's add some little square insets in here by alt clicking this ring, I and then I again and extrude it down. That's cool. And if you want to add some kind of bolty shapes, I suggest just grabbing a circle, shift D, scaling it real small, making kind of a bolt shape, and then just placing it wherever you want it to be. I'm gonna put it here and scale it down a little bit. Press period to zoom into that mesh. I'm gonna move it up, it's, it's underneath, there we go. Cool, now I can add just a whole bunch of these around this whole surface. Make sure my 3D cursor's in the middle, go to 3D cursor mode, and I'm gonna make a whole bunch of bolts around this thing. So Shift, D, R, 10 and then just press Shift R a whole bunch of times. And that repeats the command you just did. There we go, cool. That looks pretty strong and you know heavy duty, right? We can add some additional bolts if you want to um, on the other areas of it. So Shift D, I'm gonna put it right here and it's disappeared, it's, it's hidden. So I'm gonna move it up right there. Seven, Shift D R 30. Just put, what is it, like 12 of these around there. Cool, now I also suggest putting these bolts as a different material so they stand out, maybe like a more silver reflective, you know, um, not rough texture. You can also overlap shapes to add some more different types of detail. So instead of a high poly, I'm gonna do a 16 vertices cylinder here and I'm gonna turn this into a wireframe piece. So let me get this positioned right. Modifiers, wireframe, there we go. Maybe size it up a little bit, make sure it's uh, even thickness and boundary. And then I'm going to inset this top. Watch when I inset it, watch what happens. Ah, look at that, that looks awesome. 
I'm going to move it up a little bit. And then remember, this is a totally separate cylinder, so I can position this wherever I want. I'm going to move it down a little bit. I need to shrink it down. There we go. That's what I want right there. Cool. You can even copy this face and put it somewhere else, like right here. And then I for inset. And then E for extrude downwards on the Z axis. Just some different shapes and scaling of details to break up the pattern. So it's not all the same, you know, level of detail. There's some low detail, high detail, and medium detail areas. Uh, that really helps make something a little bit more believable. And also using different colored textures, like a light and a dark, um, to, you know, make sure it's not all the same metal. Cool. So that's the basics of a port. Let's see what it looks like rendered. Ooh, creepy and glowing. Now, I don't have any uh, scene lights right now, so it's just the emission lighting this up. <laughs> and it looks really cool. Okay, another thing that I did to spice up my model and make it more interesting and detailed was I actually used some kit bashing. So kit bashing is when you are using a set of objects or pieces or props to, you know, make your scene more believable. These are pre-made assets. You can buy them, you can get them for free, or you can make your own. And they exist in a separate 3D file, such as a blend file or an FBX or OBJ. And you basically import them into your scene and use them wherever you want. So let's zoom in and I'll show you some kit batch pieces that I used. So up here along this uh, inside of the shield, this is a kit batch piece that I did not make. I think it was an actual kit batch 3D piece. I have a whole bunch of kit batch files on my hard drive that I just play with whenever I need some more detailed things and I don't want to spend forever making stuff. Oh yeah, this miniature port here. I imagine it being like an indiv individual human can come out of this. This is a kit batch piece that I did not make. As you can tell, it's a separate mesh. Here's another kit batch piece that uh, obviously has a missing texture <laughs> I need to fix. Um, it's a nice kind of a bracket, like a shelving that has these cylinder tanks inside. This is a kit batch looking piece, but I actually made this myself. It's actually an escape pod. See, it launches out that way. I'm going to show you how I import and manage kit bash pieces. First, I'm going to make a collection just for the kit bash. So right click new collection. I'm going to call it kit bash two. And with it selected, I'm going to go to file import FBX. And I'm going to find the actual kit bash file that I'm going to import. Okay, so I imported my kit bash files <laughs> and they are huge. They're all over the place. So the cool thing about the fact that I made its own collection is that I, ha I can hide them. I can choose not to render them. And of course I can select all by right clicking on the collection and doing select objects. So that selects all the objects inside. So I'm gonna move these up out of the way, GZ to move them up period to kind of preview all of them. Now, of course, they're going to need to be scaled down big time because my, you know, spaceship is huge and these are supposed to be really small bracket pieces. So I can just scale them all down together if I want. Now I'm on material mode and there's a default material applied to these. I don't know if there's any texture actually put in here, any like images. Yeah, no, it's just a basic. So that's a little disappointing. Sometimes kit bash files will have really nice textures that come with them. Um, it just really depends on what you're getting. So yeah, I would go from here from choosing a piece that I want and I'm going to say, apply this to my spaceship. So I may move this to an actual collection, like an actual, you know, spaceship piece collection or like an actual kit bash collection that's going to be rendered. Whereas this collection will not be rendered in case I, you know, accidentally have it in the background. Don't want those pieces just floating in space. So I would, you know, move it down to my ship. I would, you know, align it, do whatever I want to do, scale it, texture it, all that stuff, and then move it to, you know, a final rendered collection. And I always have these, you know, pieces, just like a bunch of Legos on the floor to kind of pick from. I'm thinking, okay, I need like a, I need like a trapezoid shaped piece to go in between something. Uh, here we go. Here's a trapezoid. I can move it down and, you know, put it in the right collection, material it, and that'll be part of my final render. Saves me a lot of time. Another thing that I did was I actually made my own, you know, pieces that I reused over and over. So when I finally had kind of an aesthetic decided on and like a style of how futuristic or organic or, you know, military I wanted it to be, I made small pieces like these escape pods that I showed you and other small pieces that were going to be reused over and over. Here's another one that are, are located throughout the ship in different places. And, you know, I just re reuse them over and over. So everything has the same look. Okay, two more things for this video. I'm going to talk about lighting and then how I did the stars in the background for the final render. So lighting in space is actually super simple. It, don't overcomplicate it. If you are in a solar system, you have one light source. You have the, the star or the sun that you're orbiting around or that is in the middle of the solar system, right? If you're far away from it, the scene should be darker. If you're closer to the sun, the scene should be brighter. 
Now, that doesn't always add up to a great, you know, sci-fi scene. We may just want to play with stuff and make it look cool. Uh, and that's what we base things off is how cool it looks. But if you're going for, you know, astronomical re reality, um, you need to think about the sun being one very harsh, very strong light source. So to do that, you can do shift A, add light and sun. It's right there. Now you see a line pointing down. That is the direction of the sunlight. There is no angle to the light. It doesn't come at different angles like a flashlight does. It's like a laser. It's all straight no matter where the object is in the scene. So I could have the sun right here. You might think, oh, the sun's not shining on this ship, but it is. The sunlight is always going in that direction. Now, even if the sun is over here, it's still going to light up the scene, but the, sun is, the sunlight is going in this direction downward. So first you decide on the angle that your sun is going to be shining from or where your spaceship is in orientation to it. You need to turn it up a lot. So play with your strength and be very generous. You might want some overexposed parts of the spaceship because honestly, the sun is so strong that it makes really dark shadows too. So you, if you want a realistic render, there's gonna be a lot of contrast and a lot of overexposure and underexposure. Um, you, of course, have creative liberty to do whatever you want. You can light up the dark areas with some you know, area lights or, or whatever. Uh, you generally want to stick to one sunlight. If you are near a moon or planet, you may have some reflected light. So I have lights positioned all over so that this looks nice and bright. But I'm going to delete those now and get more of a realistic contrast look. If I go to render, you see the bottom side of the ship is dark. Not as dark as it should be, but it is dark. Now, if I want to add some planet reflection, I'm going to go to my front view. I'm going to copy this sun by doing Shift-D. I'm going to rotate it around to be opposite. And now I'm going to add some color to it. Generally, blue is a nice, a nice starting point, like a pale blue. And I'm going to turn the strength to like 10, just so we can really see it. See, this is the blue reflection from a, a ocean planet. We've got like a gas giant that you can do like, you know, orange color but you need to make sure there's a planet visible in the corner or in the background to make it make sense. If you don't have that, it's not going to make sense. It's going to be like, why is this spaceship glowing orange? Uh, it's really weird. And we've got our main sun here, which should, of course, always be the most powerful light source. Um, always have the angle really low, like 0.2, so that it's a nice harsh light. Unless you are way up close to the sun, it's going to be a very small light source, which makes it harsh light. All right, now let's finish by talking about the background. I did not want to use a space image for the background. That's just too easy, but also I wanted this to be a procedural background. So I found a shader online and I really tried to find out where I got this shader from. I have it applied to my world here. Instead of an object, it's on the world. And it's just a combination of a layered texture coordinate with a mapping, with a noise node right there, and then a color ramp but they're all being layered on screen mode and then they're being sent to a background, which is just like a basic, you know, image in the background, 360. And voila, you get dots of light from the noise texture, totally procedural, totally controllable. I can turn it down, you know, in brightness if I want to do like black, really dark in the sky or super bright, do 10 obnoxious stars everywhere. Uh, one is pretty decent. So that's how I did the um, starlight behind it. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. Hope you learned some good tricks. I would love to see what you guys build with what I've showed you here. I'm a huge spaceship junkie. I love space and, you know, sci-fi and stuff like that. So if you have any renders you'd like to show me, you can email it to me at daniel at danielgrowphoto.com. And thanks to the viewer who suggested I make this video. I do listen to y'all's comments. I do my best to comment on every one of your comments. So if you have suggestions for future videos or things you'd like to learn, maybe something you've seen me do that I maybe went too fast on, I apologize. And I just may make a video for it like I did with this one. Well, thanks for watching. Please subscribe. And I hope you'll be back soon.